A few months ago, I got the opportunity to travel out to Anoka, Minnesota to visit the Federal Ammunition Headquarters. They gave us a tour of their manufacturing facilities and we also spent some time out at the range for some demos with ballistic gelatin. Federal and their sister companies, CCI and Spear, do a lot of things really well, but they are especially well known for their self-defense ammo. Spear Gold Dot and Federal HST have developed a reputation as the standard by which all other self-defense ammo is measured. A couple of the guys who are partly responsible for maintaining that reputation are Chris Locke and Johan Bowden. Chris is the product line manager for Federal, CCI, and Spear handgun ammo, and Johan is the technical lead for Federal and Spear's law enforcement division. After the range demos, they were kind enough to take a few extra minutes out of their day to answer some questions for us on camera. Because of all the ammo testing we've done at Lucky Gunner, I get asked tons of questions about handgun ballistics. I try to answer those when I can, but these guys are far more qualified to do that. So I basically asked them some of the same questions you guys have asked me most often. The first topic was ballistic gelatin testing itself. Why do we use ballistic gel to test ammo? And how do we know that what happens in gelatin has anything to do with how bullets actually behave in the real world? Ballistic gel is, is basically a rendered substance out of animal tissue that is brought back into a mixture that, that we calibrate to a, a certain specification, which gives us a tissue density approaching that of human tissue. The other purpose for having a certain specified density as set forth by the FBI, by the way, is that you have an apples to apples to apples comparison, that you have a continuous data set that is comparable one to the other. In other words, if we have density A shooting today and we're shooting density B tomorrow, they don't necessarily correlate to each other. So it's important to have that density as a non-variable. Ballistics gel is great because it's, there is so much history and there's so much data and it's repeatable data that we can make comparisons to. And it's not always a one-to-one -one ratio. So people get a little hung up on the, one inch in gel equals one inch in, a, in, in some kind of organism, right? So it's, it's not always that, but it's important to have that baseline to understand and measure against. So this much penetration we know in this calibrated gel equates to this type of performance. So it's, it's not, people want to think things really literally, right? And, and it's not always literal. It's, it, it's just a really good test analog to give us something to compare this to this to this in a really predictable way and have a meaningful data. Take, take the variables out and make sure we know exactly what it's going to do in the vast majority of situations. And then when you start adding variables to it, you can, you can predict those a little easier. And then us being very lucky, having very good relationships with numerous law enforcement agencies over the decades, we have learned that what works on this gelatin and looks good on this gelatin ends up being correlated and proven out on the street. We have countless adjudicated cases that have been shared with us where the results were favorable on the side of law enforcement, providing a credit to our ammunition. So we, we have a connection. What works on the gelatin here ends up working on the street there. The, I guess one, one, one really cannot emphasize enough that the gelatin is a very good model. The true validation of the model is what happens when it's used for what it's intended for, namely on the street. And not necessarily by us only. I mean, we're only one player in the market. I believe the, the entity that probably deserves the most credit for all this is the FBI. You know, they have developed these, these, these specs through blood, sweat, and tears. A lot of blood too, right? That needs to be not forgotten at the very least. And it was learned that these attributes in a projectile work on human or organisms fairly well. If you've seen any of our ballistic gel tests at Lucky Gunner, you have probably noticed that we use the synthetic clear ballistics brand gel blocks rather than the organic based FBI ordnance grade gelatin that Johan was just talking about. The synthetic stuff is just much easier to work with. It's less labor intensive. The blocks come shipped right to us ready to use so we don't have to mold and mix and refrigerate them like we would the ordnance gel. The two mediums do not behave exactly the same, but for testing handgun ammo for penetration and expansion, the results are usually comparable. Where you do see a much bigger difference between the synthetic gel and the organic gel is in the temporary wound cavity. That's when the gel stretches out kind of like a balloon outward right after the bullet impacts. It looks really dramatic in gelatin, especially on high-speed video with the clear gel, 
but with pistol ammo, that temporary cavity is not actually a good indicator of how effective the ammo is going to be. That is just one of the ways that pistol ballistics differs radically from rifle ballistics, which is another topic I asked Johan and Chris to talk about. I think it can be pretty easily summarized by something that we, myself especially, learned from uh, Buford Boone at, at the FBI many years ago, where it was determined that human tissue, by and large, has a certain elasticity threshold, uh, which really means is when a handgun bullet or a projectile at handgun velocities hits human tissue, we display very briefly, too fast for the human eye to see, the so-called temporary wound cavity, right? We're made up largely of water, a non-compressible substance. In other words, that water gets out of the way of that bullet screaming in, you know, on, on impact. We have that large temporary cavity, and because we are elastic by nature, we recover from that, our tissue re recovers, comes back together, and what's left is the, temp the, the, the permanent wound cavity, namely the crushing path that that bullet took through us. This temporary wound cavity, as we expand and recover from, is different when projectiles hit at greater than 2,200 feet a second. At that point, it appears we have surpassed the elasticity capability of human tissue, and that temporary wound cavity begins tearing at its limits and margins and becomes the permanent wound cavity, which also is the conclusion why people who are center punched with rifle projectiles typically succumb much quicker than people who are hit with handgun projectiles. The byproduct of that also seems that when, when a rifle projectile at those velocities bypasses an organ, you will still have organic damage, whereas a handgun projectile needs to directly hit a vital organ to do organic damage. Very big difference in the outcome most of the time. So as the cliche goes, pistols are pistols and rifles are rifles. You can't really push a bullet out of a pistol fast enough to make it act like a rifle bullet. So that means penetration and expansion are the best metrics we have for evaluating handgun ammo. When I've brought this up in the past, the question I've always been asked is that if two handgun bullets have similar performance in gelatin, but one bullet has a lot more muzzle energy than the other one, what happens to that excess energy? If it's not translated into penetration and expansion, where does it go? Shouldn't it somehow cause the bullet to do more damage to the tissue? It seems to be obliterated or washed away by the elastic capacity of our tissue. You know, you, um, you take, for example, a 44 Magnum, right, which is a 240 grain projectile coming in in the neighborhood of 1400 feet a second. Is that significantly more than, say, a 180 grain projectile at 950 feet a second, your typical 40 cal? Yes, it's a big difference, but it does not seem to translate out into a corresponding amount of damage in a human organism. And I believe that is because we expand, we recover from that, it falls within that elasticity threshold. You take, for example, that 44 Magnum, does it make a bigger, more significant wound than, say, a 40 cal or a 9 millimeter? Yes, it does, but really not enough to matter to change the outcome of a critical event in those next few seconds that, that are crucial. However, at the same time, you launch that little bitty 55 grain pill coming out of an AR-15 at two and a half times the speed of sound, and it hits, and you see that radical planar tearing where you have tissue damage five, six inches away from the path of the bullet. That's what creates that rapid hemorrhage, the blood pressure drop, the shock setting in, tissue disruption, hopefully in the right location, uh, cardiopulmonary collapse, and things cease, lights go out. Right, and that, that really seems to be concurrent with the 2,200 feet a second that was discovered by the FBI. We want bullets, hunting bullets, personal defense bullets. We have a set of parameters of things that we're trying to achieve with it, right? There's, a, there's requirements that we have that this is what the bullet needs to do to be effective. And that's mainly, especially personal defense, it's penetration expansion. How big can we get the bullet to, to be? How deep can we get it to go? How much tissue can we crush? It's important to understand that um, energy, velocity and energy, they're interesting aspects to consider because they help you achieve that, that end goal of penetration expansion, but they don't necessarily correlate to terminal performance. So uh, a really hot 10 millimeter, for example, isn't necessarily going to achieve something that another 10 millimeter doesn't. So what we want to do is, is get to that perfect 14 to 16 inches of penetration and get the projectile as big as we can, because that is what, that is the maximum we're gonna be able to achieve with a handgun round. So you take it and push it another 100 feet per second faster, you're not gonna see more wounding potentially. And if you would, we would do it. But what you'll start to see is uh, maybe over penetrations, uh, maybe the, the upset expands 
in a way where you actually get more shallow penetrations because you're growing it fast, trying to push it too quick. So you see changes in the performance. So we don't get hung up on energy, velocity. We get hung up on penetration, expansion, the things that really are meaningful to terminal performance. We focus on that first and then the other things just kind of happen. Before we wrapped up the interview, I asked Johan and Chris each if they could pick just one or two things that they wished more shooters understood about ballistics and handgun ammo, what would they be? I don't think they did this on purpose, but it's interesting that they had similar answers. The idea that you need velocity, you have to push it fast to get a bullet to do a certain thing. We really have known that that wasn't the case since the 80s. We can make, with this modern technology, a bullet do just about anything we want it to do. So it's really find a bullet that works really well and don't get hung up on lots of numbers and other stuff and, and muzzle energy and all the other things. We can make a bullet do what it needs to do without depending on that stuff. And then don't get hung up on calibers, right? If you shoot a 45 better than you shoot a nine, carry a 45, right? There is, there is no incremental gain you get moving up to a higher caliber that is gonna overshadow your ability to shoot a smaller caliber better. You know, most of us who are quote unquote gun people have been in never ending discussions and forums and reading hundreds of articles about how much better this caliber is versus that caliber and the venerable this over the not so venerable that. And you know, I just wish that we could get the message out a little bit better that handguns are handguns. You know, it, if it's a 44 or a 357 or a 41, it really doesn't matter. They are all somewhat feeble given the potential danger that a human being can present. It is far more important to have the proper bullet design in the caliber that you, cheat, that you end up choosing. If you end up developing a flinch and your groups open up and you don't like shooting a 40 cal and you don't practice with it because you don't like the punishing recoil of it, as an example, you'll be far better off shooting something like a nine millimeter that you have confidence in that you can deliver accurate fire quickly into the vital zone of your adversary. Because in the meantime, we have learned our lessons. We can get the performance, the terminal performance of a nine millimeter projectile pretty much up on par with that of a 40, up on par with that of a 45. Don't get sidetracked by the caliber. Buy the best projectile you possibly can and shoot the caliber that you are good with. And then the thing that overrides all of them, it has to work. It's got to be reliable.